This video is a very brief introduction to post-colonialist literary theory. So it might bear repeating or explaining what I even mean by literary theory. So when we talk about the sophistication point, exploring complexities and tensions, or um, situating a passage or an interpretation within a broader context, literary theory is one way that we can situate a text within a broader context within a broader context or within just a broader range of thought. So we can think of literary theory as um, a filter or lens through which we can view a text. View or interpret a text. So for example, uh, for those of you who went to CVLCC for the middle school, monster theory, right? That guiding principle that monsters are metaphors, that is one literary theory. And so I'm introducing you right now to not so much a school of literature or a subgenre as a literary theory. Um, all right, so that's, that's kind of what we got going here in terms of post-colonialism. So, um, We'll get into like a, a strict definition in a little bit, but I think uh, some of these introductory points are worth starting with. So English is not just a language, but a literary tradition and a cultural institution that comprises the world's largest publishing market. So English is not just something that we speak in class, uh, but English, right, can, cultural institution, meaning, right, like all of the, the film, like the television, uh, music, all that kind of stuff, it forms this whole body um, that, that culture is partly made of, as well as a literary tradition. Um, all right. Now, as former colonies gained their independence, indigenous literatures throughout the former English-speaking colonies rose to prominence, such as in Australia, Africa, North America, India, the Caribbean, and so on. So when we're talking about those places, we're not looking at the diasporic movements necessarily in this point. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by diasporic in, in a moment. Um, but we're looking at like, uh, say, Mo Mori, Maori literature in Australia. And then in Africa, it really just depends, right? Like Nigerian lit is, that's a whole movement unto itself, like South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. North America, uh, someone like Joy Harjo, we could say is a post-colonialist poet of the um, indigenous North American tradition, right? So think of Joy Harjo, right? For calling the spirit back, right? That kind of thing. Joy Harjo and other like indigenous, right? Uh, creators from various tribes and groups, right? India, the Caribbean and on. So these are people that used to be a part of the UK, the United Kingdom, or the US. All right, so what is a diaspora? Because there are diasporic um, elements in post-colonialism, and then there are also immigrant elements, and those are a little bit different. All right, so diaspora, this is just a dictionary definition from Merriam-Webster, uh, is referring to people settled far from their ancestral homelands, the movement, migration, or scattering Scattering is really the operative word here of a people away from an established or ancestral homeland. So diaspora is most often uh, the term used to apply to um, like Jews in the Middle East, Jewish people, African Americans, not the same as say Nigerian land. Why? Because Nigerians are responding to, reacting to, and grappling with the effects of people coming into their homeland, colonizing it, changing it, and then leaving. Whereas for African Americans, the focus is very different because it's on the fact that they were scattered, right, against their will, pulled from their homeland, and brought to this other place where then they are made to feel other, made to feel not at home. Um, all right, so Jewish people, African Americans, and those those are the primary elements of diaspora, um, but it can also, well, I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. All right, so this new way of thinking 
not only produced new literature, but led people to question the problematic assumptions and underlying beliefs of many works of the, you know, so-called unofficial English canon, such as Jane Eyre. I'm just mentioning that one in particular because we, you know, just read it last month, right? Bertha, who was from the West Indies, taken from the West Indies, right? I.e. the Caribbean or fill in the blank. I kind of just left it open-ended because I don't know what I want to refer to and I just don't want to center, um, I don't want to center white cultural production in a discussion of post-colonial post -colonial literary theory. All right, so here are a couple quotes um, from this uh, just introductory essay by Rivkin and Ryan. I'll give you the author names here in case you're curious. Entire bodies of writing emerged out of the imperial front, that line of contact between colonizer and colonized, which is characterized as much by reciprocal envy and adulation. Another term, another a synonym for adulation is more or less like admiration, as by reciprocal fear and resentment. Each colonized nation also produced its own body of literature that dealt with the imperial experience or attempted to define a post-imperial sense of national and cultural identity, All right? So identity is gonna come up a lot in works within this uh, movement. And, and that's what a lot of people are thinking about if you're theorizing in a post-colonialist mode, okay? Or a colonialist mode. So what does that mean? Colonizer and colonized, right? That push and pull between uh, say uh, the British folks who went in to, to control and to subjugate uh, the, the resources in India versus the people who had lived there since time immemorial or in Nigeria or in Jamaica or in any of these other places, right? So it's colonizer and colonized, sometimes victor and vanquished is how it's also referred to. Uh, victor and vanquished. All right, since the emergence of new generations of people whose immigrant ethnic roots do not conflict with a sense of at-homeness in an imperial center like England, Tunis, um, see Du Bois for more on this term, double consciousness, gives way to a bilateral sense of parallel cultures and a sense of multiple belongings, plural identities, with no one more standard or so-called normal or appropriate than another. All right, so there's kind of two movements here, right? One is is um, dealing with people who are writing poetry and uh, short stories and all that kind of stuff, um, who are producing literature in these lands that had been colonized but have now gained their independence. This second paragraph is really referring to and describing post-colonialist movement and literature within places like England um, and other places that were the centers of colonizers, but have also experienced waves of immigration into those centers because of you know job opportunity and all the rest of that. So this is kind of referring maybe to the like cultural production of um, say immigrants from the West Indies, like the Caribbean to England or at other places, um, say immigrants from former colonies, I'm just gonna say former colonies to Canada, US, Australia, England. You get the idea, right? Um, and how they experience being both at home in these new uh, cultures and how at the same time they perhaps feel at home to a certain extent in the places uh, of their, you know, ethnic or cultural origin. All right. So that's, that's your first brief introduction. All right. Now on to, um, 
Anya Lumba situating colonial and post-colonial studies. So here are some basic points. Because language is subject to a continuous change, especially English, the meanings of the terms colonialism and post-colonialism tend to shift depending on geographical, historical, and or social context. So language is always changing. And who you talk to, where you're talking to them, context is key. Modern colonialism not only sapped natural and human resources from the conquered lands, but also transformed the economy, right, into, into capitalist economies and exacerbated in economic inequities, which connects uh, to this block quote right here. Modern colonialism did more than extract tribute, goods, and wealth from the countries it conquered. It restructured the economies of the latter, drawing them into a complex relationship with their own so that there was a flow of human and natural resources between colonized and colonial countries. Think triangle trade in the 19th century. Uh, in whatever direction human beings and materials traveled, the profits always flowed back into the so-called mother country, right? So if we're talking about the US and West Africa and England, and the way those goods traveled back and forth. Africa was losing resources that are getting pumped into these other countries with very little in return, right? Loss of natural resources and a loss of human resources on their, on their part, right? Um, so that's that, pointing to that, but what's complex we could say about this is that that relationship is always going to be there, even after, uh, you know, West African nations and other African nations have gained their independence from England, say. And even after the slave trade was ended, there is always going to be a relationship there, right? Although fraught, traumatic, uh, it is in fact inextricable. So like it says, while the effects of colonialism may differ greatly from state to state, Right? We, we can't say that all former colonies have the same experience, right? Every, everything is different depending on um, geography, natural resources, uh, home culture and the like. It always results in fraught. Fraught means like difficult, emotional, traumatic, and ultimately inextricable relationships. Why is this inextricable? Uh, for example, for one, in Nigeria, English is one of the primary um, official languages. Not because English is better in some way, uh, but because it simply is a really useful lingua franca for people who speak dozens of different languages and are comprised of multiple ethnicities, cultures, and tribes. Example, English as official language in Nigeria. All right, and then one more block quote from this Lumba piece. It might be said that because the age of colonialism is over and because the descendants of once colonized peoples live everywhere, the whole world is post-colonial. Right, it could be said there are, are no more English colonies. And yet, the term has been fiercely contested on many counts. Right, so that's why we're referring to this text as colonial and post-colonial. That some people take issue with post, right? Because post means after. The prefix post complicated matters because it implies an aftermath in two senses, temporal as in coming after and ideological as in supplanting, that there is this post-colonial reality. It is the second implication which critics of the term have found contestable. 
if the inequities of colonial rule have not been erased, it is perhaps premature to proclaim the demise of colonialism. So in other words, like because many of these former colonies had to struggle and resist and fight for their independence for years, decades even, centuries perhaps in some cases, if that hasn't ended completely, right? If the effects, if the inequities have not been completely erased, some thinkers contend that it's not accurate to add that post to colonial. If the inequities, whether they be right economic, social, um, we could even say perhaps like ideological, still exist, then is colonialism really over? So that's the question. I can't give an answer to that. Lots of people uh, have different answers for that. It's kind of an unanswerable question. All right, one last thing from here. Colonialism is not just something that happens from outside a country or people, not just something that operates with the collusion of forces inside, but a version of it can be duplicated from within. So internalized. Internalized and internal colonialism. It has been suggested that it is more helpful to think of post-colonialism not just as coming literally after colonialism and signifying its demise, but more flexibly as the contestation of colonial domination and the legacies of colonialism. All right, and we'll say that this is probably our best working definition of what is meant by post-colonialism. The contestation of colonial domination and the contestation of the legacies of colonialism. All right, so contest and contestation is a very popular word in literary theory in general. So this is just like referring to people disagreeing, like disagreement or like suggesting that something is problematic, that the domination of a colonial culture, colonial language, all that kind of stuff is something that they feel like they want to disagree with and like kind of just like point out as being problematic as well as disagreeing uh, disagreeing or just like pointing out the troubling legacies of colonialism so if I'm gonna like put a definition here in a little bit um, plainer language um, this is the theory that um, being colonized has lasting traumatic troubling and I'm just going to say mixed effects on the people who were colonized. Being colonized has lasting traumatic, troubling, and mixed effects on the people who were colonized, right? Mixed meaning, I'm just using that to signify it's not necessarily all bad. This is not a black and white issue. There's a lot of gray, but a lot of times post-colonial literature does focus on that, right? And what does it affect? It affects like people's formation of identity. It affects people's like self-worth. Um, it affects like economic prospects, all sorts of things, right? 
the other part of like colonialist or post-colonialist theory is kind of going back and and looking at the legacies of colonialism, examining pieces like Jane Eyre or uh, the work of Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book, um, and kind of examining what about what they were writing is also troubling and mixed that maybe we were just taking at face value, right? So kind of questioning people who wrote within like a colonial perspective and um, pointing out ways that um, they may have unintentionally been demoralizing or harming uh, the people who were colonized. All right, and last we have uh, Jamaica Kincaid, A Small Place. She is the author of Girl, the last uh, piece of short fiction we're reading in this unit. And these are a few excerpts from what's a, a little bit of a longer essay. So just to introduce the piece, this is another term, secondary colonialism. And this is a term coined to describe the effect of residents of richer, more developed countries, like former colonizers, who invest time and energy into poorer, less developed countries for, we'll just say, self-serving purposes, such as tourism. Um, before visiting, besides visiting these places for purely recreational purposes, um, tourists may also objectify the local residents, either in a dehumanizing and disrespectful way, or perhaps inadvertently uh, objectifying them by tokenizing them and turning them into symbols of heritage, authenticity, culture, things along those lines, all right? Such as like, right, appropriating their art, their cultural productions, their, you know, style, things like that. Or even just by like taking selfies with them, right? Just, just to kind of like virtue signal uh, so-called authenticity, or perhaps to, to try and get back in touch with their own roots, right? Virtue signaling, that would be like, say, uh, participating in a service trip just um, to post it on social media and look like a, you know, quote unquote, good person. All right, so that's secondary colonialism. That essentially people who are in developed countries are sometimes uh, doing things to to invade uh, these now independent countries and uh, take advantage of them. So here are uh, three excerpts from this piece. You needn't let that slightly funny feeling you have from time to time about exploitation, oppression, domination develop into full-fledged unease, discomfort. You could ruin your holiday. They are not responsible for what you have. You owe them nothing. In fact, you did them a big favor and you can provide 100 examples. So this is just like an attitude of entitlement. Entitlement and then just also avoidance of reality. Again, on that note, you must not wonder what happened when you brush your teeth. Oh, it might all end up in the water. You are thinking of taking a swim in. The contents of your laboratory might, just might, graze gently against your ankle as you wade carefree in the water. For, you see, in Antigua, there is no proper sewage disposal system. But the Caribbean Sea is very big, and the Atlantic Ocean is even bigger. It would amaze even you to know the number of black slaves this ocean has swallowed up. When you sit down to eat your delicious meal, it's better that you don't know that most of what you are eating came off a plane from Miami. So this is like some really heavy irony right that the native does not like the tourists is not hard to explain for every native of every place is a potential tourist and every tourist is a native of somewhere every native everywhere lives a life of overwhelming and crushing banality and boredom and desperation and depression and every deed good and bad is an attempt to forget this every native would like to find a way out Every native would like a rest. Every native would like a tour. But some natives, most natives in the world, cannot go anywhere. They are too poor. They are too poor to go anywhere. They are too poor to escape the reality of their lives. So this is pointing out like tourism 
as escape, attempted escape from the drudgery of daily life. But not everyone has that choice. Now, is Kincaid in this passage saying, don't go to the Caribbean? Don't tour different places? No, not necessarily, right? There was some irony here. And I think it's just worth kind of getting underneath the surface of of people's uh, frequent thoughtlessness, right? That she's saying that people travel and people do a lot of things in daily life in order to just forget, in order to forget uncomfortable realities. And I, I would say the suggestion here is not to not travel, but to remember, to keep that in front of mind and, and to not ignore marginalize and use uh, people who are in the service industry and in the tourist industry. If you are interested in reading more, I've got my work cited here. I'd be happy to give you uh, a full copy of any of those uh, pieces. And then uh, this is linked. This document is available in our class slideshow. And I would recommend this link, especially for further read reading. If you're interested in these movements, um, interested in authors and in, in this kind of like branch of literature as well as theory. Um, this is a really great link that is organized by region and is organized by uh, genre as well. All right, that's all.